Hello, folks. I uh, see we've got a good turnout. Glad to see so many folks signed up uh, for this um, session. And uh, my name is uh, Miguel Perez Gibson. And hello and welcome uh, to the second session of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference, Evolving Management of State Forest Lands for Public Benefit. And again, my name is Miguel. I work for the Washington Environmental Council as the State Forest Policy Advisor. Uh, first, uh, a few housekeeping notes if you're new to the conference. If you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of the webinar screen. Uh, you can also use the uh, chat box to send messages, uh, but keep in mind that any message will be visible to uh, all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions uh, to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which uh, you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. Again, it's at your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. And we'll be, uh, we have an able crew here sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. Um, as a reminder, the session will be recorded and shared uh, with all participants next week. So that's a good thing. You get to take another listen. So, okay, let's get started with this session. Uh, for context, uh, approximately 2 million acres of state trust lands were. Uh, granted to Washington State uh, by the federal government upon uh, statehood. And uh, actually, um, as well, there's included in that is uh, county forest trust lands that were um, acquired by the state uh, independent of that grant, but are included in the 2 million acres of state trust lands. Uh, in July um, this, of 22 this year, our state Supreme Court issued a decision in the Conservation Northwest v. Franz case, affirming that the state's Department of Natural Resources is not required <clears throat> to maximize revenue generation on these lands above all other objectives, and the agency has broad discretion to balance revenue generation with other public benefits, <clears throat> such as carbon storage and biodiversity. Establishing a new innovative path forward will require reimagining policies and processes, scientific analysis of diverse public benefits, and local stakeholder engagement in decision making about their local forests. This panel uh, will be advancing dialogue related to this evolution by bringing together three important voices in the evolution ahead elected county leaders, DNR staff, and technical experts. Elected county leaders from Thurston, Whatcom, and Jefferson County will share their experiences related to uh, the management of state forest lands, their perspectives on opportunities for management of state lands for multiple benefits after the Conservation Northwest v. France decision, and how they envision local community shaping management decisions. A scientific expert will share insights on modeling for the forest management of the future which includes greater complexity and multi-objective optimization. DNR will speak about the agency's current plans to adapt to management for public benefits in response to the agency's broaden, broaden discretion, evolving stakeholder expectations and new science. I'd like to also add in terms of the topic of evol evolving uh, state land forest management, uh, evolving is the right word because it has been continually evolving. I've been involved uh, on state forest land management for almost, well, I guess over 45 years, and I have seen it uh, continually <laughs> evolve. I uh, worked in the old growth forest way back in the day, and I've seen since the passage of the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, uh, changes in forest practices and changes um, how forests have are being managed today uh, from where, where, where I first started over four decades ago. I'm really delighted to have the speakers that we have with us today. Um, 
they are, uh, and, and thank you, thank you to all for uh, spending your uh, some of your precious time being part of our conference. We are really indebted to you, and we really look forward to this session. And um, I think all of the participants, you will find this of great interest, and we look forward to your uh, input and questions as you um, hear our speakers. So I'd like to introduce our speakers. I'd like to start with... Um, from the Department of Natural Resources, who's gonna kick us off, the ABLE Deputy Supervisor for State Uplands, uh, acting uh, in this case, but still uh, fully engaged in this activity from for the Washington Department of Natural Resources, Dwayne Evans, Emmons. Ah, Dwayne, thank you for joining us. Um, County Commissioner from Jefferson County um, is Heidi Eisenhower. By the way, the bios for all these folks are in the chat, I believe, and you can read in more detail uh, about who they are. But again, uh, thank you, Heidi. And then Ty uh, Menser is County Commissioner from Thurston County. And Todd uh, Donovan, who is County Council Member with Whatcom County Council. And finally, our, our uh, content expert, if you will, Dr. Sandor Toth who is the Donald J. and Robert J. G. Uh, McLaughlin Associate Professor of Natural Resources Informatics at the University of Washington. Thank you so much for being here today as well. So turning to our panelists, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Duane to kick us off, uh, giving us the perspective of uh, the Department of Natural Resources. They're facing a sustainable harvest calculation and Duane just made an able presentation to the Board of Natural Resources yesterday on the task ahead. And so Duane, uh, over to you. All right, thank you, Miguel. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, you're right, Miguel. Um, uh, we did just do a presentation to the Board of Natural Resources at our, our regular monthly meeting uh, yesterday. I am going to go through that in a little bit of detail, not in excruciating detail uh, like we did yesterday. Uh, I will spare you all of that. Um, and I will try and figure out uh, how to control. I think I know how to control it now. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of what uh, we are embarking on uh, for the next sustainable harvest um, to give you uh, all a sense of where we are in that planning process. Um, and then how um, the Supreme Court case, the Washington Supreme Court case may or may not have changed uh, how we approach our sustainable harvest. So versus the question, the uh, what, where, and why. Why do we do sustainable harvest? Uh, what are some of the policies and, and laws that impact trust land management? And then what things may the department be considering for the next sustainable harvest and how that works uh, with the uh, State Environmental Policy Act uh, considerations. So first, the what? A sustainable harvest uh, calculation is, is looking out 100 years, looking at uh, projection of growth and harvest, but then setting a harvest level for the next 10 years. So you're considering that 100 year you know, lifespan, but then you're only looking at the next 10 years of harvest. Um, the idea is to look and provide a sustainable flow of volume for, for us, for current and future generations in perpetuity. Uh, we also are considering habitat considerations and other objectives, whether those are from the board's policies for sustainable forests, um, from uh, legal requirements, or other objectives that we don't want to uh, come into conflict with that sustainable harvest level. So the where is on forested state trust lands, on lands that are not deferred from harvest for whichever reason. And uh, a decision the Board of Natural Resources made during the last sustainable harvest uh, was we wouldn't be including riparian volume uh, in that sustainable harvest calculation. Uh, the long and short of that decision was because that amount of volume is uncertain. And so we didn't want to, um, to guarantee to beneficiaries and uh, encumber the department with a volume that we would be guaranteeing to come out of uh, riparian harvest or riparian restoration thinnings um, and then set an arbitrary uh, target that we wouldn't be able to meet. So then again, the where, 
this is a map of uh, 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 forested trust lands and natural area and a natural resource conservation area, the Morning Star, which is in the, in the green, up in uh, Snohomish County. So when we're looking at uh, uh, the sustainable harvest, uh, we're considering the, um, all of the lands that the department's managing, both trust lands and those non-trust lands, those conservation lands, but we're only getting that sustainable harvest volume from the, the gray shaded areas. Um, we're further only looking at those areas that are not uh, deferred from harvest. So areas like um, uh, uh, set-asides for our habitat conservation plan, for unstable slopes, for um, a riparian uh, protections, et cetera. Uh, these areas that are shaded then in dark green um, have either are completely deferred from harvest or uh, may only be available for uh, thinning or you know, habitat uh, restoration projects. So in areas of spotted owl, uh, in our spotted owl management areas uh, where we haven't achieved um, a certain threshold, we would only be doing uh, thinnings to accelerate uh, uh, the creation of structure. Uh, the same with riparian areas where we would be doing, um, uh, again, the uh, riparian restoration work. Uh, we can do uh, some thinning in there, but we're not uh, doing regeneration harvests in those areas. And so primarily the volume for the next sustainable harvest is coming then from, again, those gray areas that have the full range of management uh, alternatives available. So the why, first of all, it's just prudent land management. Um, uh, as many of you know, uh, the department certified uh, voluntarily under two different uh, green certification systems, uh, statewide under the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and in our South Puget planning area under uh, uh, the Forest Stewardship Certification as well. And so uh, both of those require um, uh, having a sustainable harvest level. Um, but again, it's just good uh, land management. Um, there is also a board policy from the Policy for Sustainable Forests, state statute that requires us to calculate a sustainable harvest, and a business need. Uh, it again just makes sense to have a sustainable harvest level that uh, you're working toward. So uh, under that bucket or umbrella of prudent land management, we have to meet those trust responsibilities we have to look forward at things like climate disturbance, resilience, um, protect ecological health and habitat, meet those commitments of our habitat conservation plan, of that green certification, uh, and of other policies within the policy for sustainable forests. Um, then to our fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, Miguel touched on a little bit the conservation Northwest uh, uh, v. Fran's uh, case. Um, the very long and short of that is uh, when uh, Conservation Northwest uh, and the other plaintiffs brought a challenge to the Marble Murelet decision in 2019 and the uh, sustainable harvest calculation that the board approved uh, also on that same day in 2019, um, they brought challenge in Superior Court. Uh, that court dismissed those claims. Um, and that was then uh, brought up to the uh, Washington State Supreme Court. Uh, the court recognized and acknowledged the true uh, Enabling Act created beneficiaries, named beneficiaries. And they also noted that the state constitution reflects that same trust mandate. Um, they uh, went into a little more detail affirming these are true fiduciary trusts. They restated those trust concepts of undivided loyalty, uh, intergenerational equity, uh, prudent um, person doctrine. But ultimately what they did was they affirmed the lower court's decision. They did not set aside any law. They did not set aside any board policy, any board decisions. They did not strike down Skamania v. State. They affirmed the lower court's decision and didn't change anything else. So what does that mean for our next sustainable harvest? It means 
we continue to follow the statutes that are in place for uh, calculating a sustainable harvest. Um, the policy for sustainable forests, uh, which is board policy, uh, it directs the department to look at uh, generating trust revenue while providing those environmental protections, social benefits, and other uh, benefits consistent with the duties of a fiduciary. Uh, when we argued uh, in the state Supreme Court, we argued that we don't have a directive to maximize revenue. The department recognizes that there's a blend and a balance that we need to strike. And so that was our argument. We aren't directed and we don't seek to maximize revenue. We seek to optimize revenue while considering other constraints. So we're also directed to use our best professional judgment, best available science, sound forestry, and achieve excellence in public stewardship. Uh, we're also directed to promote active, innovative, and sustainable stewardship on as much of the land base as possible. So all of these things are then built into uh, our models as we're looking to set the next sustainable harvest level. Uh, I'll go a little faster because I know this will get deep in the weeds and we've got a number of other folks that need to talk. Um, this just talks to, we'll recalculate uh, when things change, but here's the statute that directs us to generate a sustainable harvest calculation and uh, provide a sustained yield plan on a continuing basis without curtailment or you know, cessation. So this is the state statute that we have to follow when we're calculating a sustainable harvest level. Uh, what are the impacts uh, or what impacts that management on state trust lands? First is state law. We have to follow uh, forest practices rules where our HCP doesn't supersede those rules. Um, and then uh, as we note fairly often uh, to the board, we are an administrative agency of the state. We can't do things that we haven't granted, been granted the power to do. And so those powers are in you know, these statutes here and they direct how we're uh, able to do our work up and to including how we have to print an auction book and put it at the front desk of the NRB on the fourth floor, even though you have to have an escort to come up to the fourth floor of the NRB We've tried to change that statute and haven't even been successful changing a statute like that. Um, we're guided by the policy for sustainable forests, which I know many of you are, are well familiar with. Um, also guided by our habitat conservation plan. Uh, this is a multi-species uh, habitat conservation plan, which was most recently updated uh, with that amendment to the uh, Marble Muralette in 2019. So that HCP covers uh, mostly the west side with, you can see some areas uh, in Eastern Washington. Um, there are a few elements that don't uh, transfer over into those Eastern Washington lands, uh, primarily the um, riparian restoration strategy uh, in uh, parts of Yakima, Klickitat, and Chelan County. And then uh, we have the Loomis State Forest Plan, uh, which guides our work on Loomis State Forest, the Lake Whatcom Lake Landscape Plan, the South Puget uh, Forest Land Plan, and the Olympic Experimental Stores, Forest uh, Land Plan. So we have uh, plans that uh, then further guide our work in those different landscapes. We of course have other plans, our 20 year forest health strategic plan, our plan for climate resilience and a lynx habitat management plan uh, that mostly covers the Loomis State Forest. So plans are not set in stone and uh, they can be changed. And one of the things we'll be looking at now as we're working through our next sustainable harvest is that's the opportunity when we have that large uh, programmatic EIS um, and we're doing that large uh, environmental uh, review is to have new policy concepts come forward. Uh, things like uh, looking uh, even closer at carbon and carbon sequestration, looking at um, uh, 
climate resilience, looking at uh, other things that the board, the commissioner uh, may want to uh, incorporate into uh, our sustainable harvest. So that's where we are now. We're kind of here at that uh, uh, part number one, and then we'll be moving through over the next two years, the next sustainable harvest and looking to incorporate new objectives, new uh, policies, new uh, ways of approaching uh, the sustainable harvest. So I will pause there and turn it over to the next speaker. And I see the attorneys on both sides of the uh, Conservation Northwest v. Franz case will uh, relitigate in the comments. And I look forward to reading the chat on that. And you're muted, Miguel. So, oh gosh, Dwayne, uh, first, thank you for doing a, a really excellent job in summarizing a really complicated topic. I uh, do want to point out a few clarifying uh, points. Um, the sustainable forest law, but by, by the way, is an example of um, the sustained yield law of how forest has been evolving in the state of Washington. And that was a big deal when that was passed way back when, not that far back when. Um, second point, um, and, and Dwayne, I think you did an excellent job of framing how staff is uh, framing the next calculation. I think, um, and this will is a nuanced thing, but I um, just for a clarifying question of you, I, I, I think uh, when I hear what you're saying is that the uh, CNWV France didn't require any change in statutes or policies to be in compliance with that decision. Uh, but I would say further, as your last slide shows uh, with respect to policies, the uh, board could entertain a, a, maybe a broader set of policies, for instance, if they so chose, if they wanted to uh, look at older forests, uh, extension of rotations, they could look at that. If they were interested in, say, a uh, policy on what you do with parcels that are in communities where there's a community interest or neighborhood is issues, they could entertain that. So I think, um, would you agree that uh, the board has, um, um maybe more flexibility i say uh, maybe more <clears throat> more flexibility in how to write new policies looking at carbon or other things than they may have had in the past um so what i would say is uh, uh, like i said uh, even the policy for sustainable forests which was written in 2006 or or um uh, adopted in 2006 recognize that the department does have discretion in how they manage. Uh, as we said, we don't claim that we have to maximize revenue regardless of other interests. Um, we have uh, in that policy uh, currently, um, uh, and we give our field staff that discretion to uh, look at uh, visual quality, for example, if we have areas that are um, you know, a significant area that may not be in something like the, you know, the Columbia Gorge, you know, scenic area. Um, they're able to de design a timber sale to uh, leave more uh, leaf trees for visual quality. Um, we can increase the, the size of buffers uh, where we need to. We can respond to those community concerns. Um, you know, uh, similarly with, um, you know, working with counties and, and uh, county governments, uh, you know, we've worked with uh, all of the commissioners that will be speaking today on, you know, issues like this. Sometimes we don't agree. And we do say that we can't just set that timber sale aside. We can't just, you know, set 3000 acres aside to respond to, you know, community concerns, because we do have a fiduciary obligation. But we can work with uh, communities, work with community groups, work with uh, you know uh, other elected officials on you know finding a path forward. Hopefully, uh, that helps everyone. Well, Dwayne, thank you, and uh, I'm glad you mentioned the prudent person doctrine. And also, I would expect there's the intergenerational equity piece, which yep. is these lands are being managed forever. And so God knows what the climate's going to be like in 100 years. So I hope that we, as you move forward and the board moves forward, we'll be taking into consideration exactly. uh, all those all those uh, elements. Um, by the way, I want to thank, we have over 80 uh, participants and I see they're from 
all over the map in terms of forestry. We have folks from the timber industry. We have folks from the feds. We have um, stakeholders, a whole a host of folks. Thank you, thank you, thank you for showing up. And um, this is the kind of um, panel um, and panel interest that we were hoping um, that we would um, stimulate uh, some um, participants and involvement. I'm gonna turn to our next speaker um, coming from Jefferson County. Uh, Heidi Eisenhower, a, uh, a greener. Hi, hi, hello, Heidi. I'm on the board of Evergreen, so I'm proud of our greeners. So thank you, thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Miguel. I'm a proud gooey duck. <laughs> but people do um, remind me they have more charismatic megafauna as their uh, school uh, mascots uh, often. Um, so my slideshow doesn't look like that should be Jefferson County Forest Management is the first, there we go. Okay, so I, let me see if I know. So I, I, I okay, I'll just start. So um, thank you for inviting me to speak with you all today. And I am excited to be on this panel with a number of my colleagues from both DNR and other counties around the region. Um, there's a very active con conversation going on right now about the county's roles in forest management. And I want to talk a little bit today about um, a program that Jefferson County started in 2019 before I was a commissioner and some things we've learned through that program and how we're, we're planning to carry that into the future. Um, the work on the Jefferson County Forest Program was... Uh, undergirded by a report that was written in 2011 called the Forest for the Future um, Report. And it was put together by a number of local natural resource experts. And it identified and mapped uh, 45 parcels, uh, DNR parcels totaling 23 over 23,000 acres uh, and explored management options for all of those parcels. Um, and so that, that report was kind of a guiding guiding document for the development of Jefferson County's forestry program and the work that we're doing now. Um, next slide. Do I say next slide to get to it or can I do it myself? Oh, I have it, I see, okay. Okay, so there's a couple of slides for context here. We, we obviously have seen changes over time. I mean, the, the uh, image at the left is very much Pre, um, pre colonization, when uh, our tribal community partners and uh, neighbors lived here and had a much lighter touch impact on the land. Um, flash forward a whole bunch of years, and the, the image in the middle represents disease and patches of forest in um, East Jefferson County. So we've seen disease come into our forests. We've also seen um, heat increasing more, more on the east side of Puget Sound in this um, upper right hand image, but definitely also on the Olympic Peninsula in some parts of um, Jefferson County, not as much in Jefferson County, but still heat is, a, is an increasing uh, issue in our forests. And then this uh, graph at the bottom is the U.S. drought monitor, and we can obviously see that uh, the the abundance of water and um, that the its uh, affiliated effects on forests are also a problem in the forests of East Jefferson County. So these are all just some kind of contextual issues that we're aware of as we move through um, our conversations right now. Um, so. Forests obviously have an important role and they serve myriad um, specific roles in our livelihood and our wellness. And two that we'll talk a little bit about today are uh, available of natural resources, the wood that we get from forests, all of us, everyone on this call, everyone in the Zoom room, everyone on the attendee list uses paper somehow. And I would, if, if not, I would love in the Q&A for the person who doesn't use paper to tell me how they achieve that. Um, and, and wood products. And then climate regulation. I mean, a big part of the conversation right now is carbon 
And I'll touch on that towards the end of my presentation. But obviously what I just wanted to underscore here is there are so many things. I am an active chanterelle hunter in the season. Um, you know, I, I live near the shore and see firsthand the um, importance of forests for flood protection. And then I am an active outdoor recreationist and use um, our forests all the time for kind of my own mental health. And I don't want that to be um, forgotten that they're really important for the mental health of our communities. So, um, so a little bit about the Jefferson County Forestry Program. Um, in 2019, we started with a feasibility study just to say, what would it look like if Jefferson County um, managed some of the forests that we own uh, for forest health improvement and ecological restoration. So we undertook a pilot project and I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna show you an example of one of our pilot parcels in the next few slides, slides so I'm not gonna go into detail here, but we, we undertook a pilot project looking at um, forest health improvement and ecological restoration through selective thinning and um, also uh, kind of engaging recreational allies and understanding how um, we might expand access to some of our forests by doing some thinning and um, recreational planning activities. So currently within the land management suite of tools, reconveyance is an option for counties uh, for the state forest board or the county forest board lands which are also known as the state forest transfer trust lands those are the lands that were were um, transferred to the state to manage on behalf of the counties um, in the 20s and after the the economic impact of the 20s and 30s and there are a number of acres, 14,000 acres in East Jefferson County in the State Forest Transfer Trust. And so reconveyance of those acres is an option. We've only done it a couple of times in Jefferson County in, in the past, but it's something that we're looking at in terms of um, expanding some of our parks and recreation opportunities and also our forestry program. And I would say, um, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. So we are right now are doing some analysis at the current year, and we are working with Chickadee Forestry, um, uh, Mallory Weinheimer here, and she's doing a report that she's going to present to our board of county commissioners next month. But we've been doing a lot of work together and looking at a lot of um, potential parcels that we might co-manage somehow with DNR or ask for reconveyance or apply one of the other tools in the toolbox, such as trust land transfer, um, getting getting a parcel on the trust land transfer list, um, working with DNR on their uh, management plans for or forestry practices for different parcels. So there's a lot of options in the works right now, and we're having active conversations almost every day. And um, okay, so next slide. One thing that Mallory underscored the importance of is, is thinning. There's a parcel called Trailhead Park. I think there's a picture of it coming up um, that was adjacent to one of our really beloved uh, regional trails. And Trailhead Park became the parking area for the Larry Scott Trail, which connects to the Olympic Discovery Trail. There was a timber stand adjacent to the parking lot I forget if it's 20, 20 acres. Um, and it was one of those awful <laughs> stands of timber where the trees are like toothpicks and they're all packed in together. And it looked just like a, a fire waiting to happen. And so Mallory went in and did a whole bunch of um, pre-commercial thinning and developed a number of openings and changed the, the look of the forest completely. And this um, picture of the, of the trees are from that, that um, harvest. Um, another forestry management regime that Mallory is very knowledgeable um, in is variable density harvests and kind of planning how and where you thin your forests for the health of the forests. And so when, as we start thinking about managing some um, 
additional tracts of land as part of our park system, um, this will be one of the uh, regimes that Mallory deploys. Um, and I would say, I don't know if I said this already, but the only way the state allows you to reconvey lands is if as a county, it comes into your park system. Kitsap County has done this most in the state, Western Washington, at least Kitsap County is the county that's really effectively had a bunch of lands reconveyed for their parks, um, parks program and is doing um, alternative timber practices on those tracts of land as part of their parks program. And it's kind of uh, Mallory's guiding light for the work she wants to do here in Jefferson County. So just a little data, we the county owns 1800 acres of land of all types of land, um, 300 parcels, and most of those parcels are under 10 acres each. But it's not lost on us that 80% of that land, of that 1,800 acres, is covered in forest and, and in variable you know, states of health. So from our 2021 pilot, uh, Mallory undertook four uh, harvests. And you can see they varied widely on, in terms of the um, acre, the, the revenue per acre that we generated. The one I was just talking about, Trailhead Park, was the most, the hardest um, harvest she did. And obviously we lost a little bit of money there. We gained a little bit on some of the other parcels, Chimicum Park, which is uh, across the street from the Chimicum schools and is um, uh, used to be a campground. It's been closed for a number of years, but it's also a park there. That one was more um, financially lucrative. So. You know, we're looking at with this this report that Mallory is working on now, kind of doing some analysis in advance of future harvests that we might do to see what kind of revenue we could project. And I thought there'd be no way that I could use 15 minutes, but I'm feeling like I might be going over. But anyway, I'm going to, I will just keep going. Just another um, minute or so would be great. Okay, this is Trailhead Park, the one I was talking about. So the photo on the left is, is before the harvest. The photo on the right is after the harvest. And you obviously see there's more openings and more light getting into the forest floor. Um, you see some of the, the coarse woody debris on the ground. So proof picture speaks a thousand words. This is Chimicum Park, the, the site that I um, talked about a second ago and some of the data about that harvest. And it was also um, featured in the Portland airport as a model project. Um, so now we're working with DNR. It started with a conversation that happened in the beginning of 2022, where we asked DNR to slow down on some timber sales in Beaver Valley, and which is um, coming into the county off of the highway. I don't know if everyone knows where Beaver Valley is. Anyway, there were two timber sales. We asked them to slow down and if we could have some conversations, which we did. We um, told them that we were interested in knowing more about the carbon project and potentially being considered for early inclusion in the carbon project. And then we're also talking about a number of different management strategies that we might do in collaboration with DNR or after reconveying some of the state forest transfer trust lands back to the county. And I've already mentioned those before, and I can share these slides with anyone. But it's not lost on us, and it's a guiding principle at this point that not just the, the way that we um, manage lands for Jefferson County, but also the larger conversation that longer rotations keep more car carbon in the forests. And that's Mallory's whole premise in her management of some of our Jefferson County parklands is longer rotations, let the trees get bigger, keep the bigger trees on the ground. And so this is, this is a guiding principle in all the conversations and the work that we're doing together right now. We are looking at two DNR, we're looking at a number of DNR parcels. Two of them are uh, depicted here. One is adjacent to county land. It's, I think it's actually this parcel. Um, and then this is uh, 
this parcel off Cape George Road has a piece of old growth in it here, just south of Cape George Road, and then a number of other stands that have been um, harvested in the last, I'd say, uh, six, 10, and 40 years. Heidi, I'm going to ask you to sum up as quickly as you can. Okay. Getting to the end. I won't go into the Cape George. <laughs> There's a lot of details about Cape George. We did find 300 year old trees in Cape George though. Um, another area that we've worked actively in partnership with DNR over the years is the Daybob Bay Natural Area, which is in the South part of the county and is a wonderful area to come and visit. And if you want to let me know and I can show you how to get in there. <laughs> Great. And then we have, as I, as I mentioned, talked to DNR about being included in the carbon project and this was our um then the phase two map that they delivered to the county earlier this year so that's my last slide sorry thank you thank you thank you thank you very impressive um gosh uh and the forests in jefferson county they, they are dry forests anyway you rain you don't get that much rain uh i mean squim gets a lot less but still it's a dry area especially that blend peninsula as i recall used to live out that way have a granddaughter born in port townsend by the way mm -hmm. uh and fascinating that kitsap is doing uh, um, management of those reconveyance so all that i'm sure will um create some questions in our uh magnificent uh, participant list here almost 100 people it looks like to me uh we're going to turn to ty uh, ty are you here, our, my county commissioner from uh, Thurston County. I am here. Yes. Uh, Ty, Ty, I got a special treat for you. I know you're the Oli Mountain Boys. So there you go. <laughs> Uh oh, now I started something. I apologize, everybody. Um, we have a dueling banjos now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ty. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I had two slides only, and I don't, yeah. And I'll, I'll just let you know and I can stick through. Um, so thank you for inviting me to be part of this and uh, sharing. I'm just going to share kind of how Thurston County um, has gotten involved through community input, moving this conversation forward in our county. Um, you know, we have show that first slide just to give folks an overview. If you're not familiar with Thurston County, oh, I can control. I saw, oops, there we go. Awesome. So here's our county, and we have three commissioner districts that run north to south in thirds. And I'm the commissioner for the western third. And as you can see, the green is uh, Capital State Forest. Uh, lands, uh, is, which is the concentration of most of our state lands are there in Capital State Forest. So they're all in my district. But when I ran for office in 2018, took office in 2019, I knew nothing about management of these lands and how, how it was done. I was focused on county issues. Uh, it did not come up in my campaign. I was never asked a question about it. Um, I really didn't know about the trusts and the history, um, really. I mean, other than just very superficially. So, um, you know, this this was the case until uh, this came to my attention first in the fall of 2021. So about a year ago, there was a cut called Oracle, where a group of citizens who live, it, it, it's really close to the eastern edge of that green area you see on the map. Um, the folks that live, that, that live nestled up right uh, underneath the cut had been using, it was a piece of legacy forest, meaning it had been, uh, had not been cut in, you know, 80 years. So it had a structural complexity that gave it a really nice character and they used it for recreation trails they it was kind of an in almost like an informal like a neighborhood managed park in a sense because they had certain you know people would come and park and walk and so they came to me saying you know they're about to cut this and it really means a lot to our neighborhood it was a very localized concern from a specific group of citizens um and they wanted to know whether the county would be willing to use the recon you know they explained to me what legacy forests were and how there might be an argument for protecting this piece of forest beyond just their neighborhood, you know, recreation concerns. And then they wondered if the county would be willing to use the reconveyance tool that Heidi made reference to. Um, so I want to step back just to give an overview of what you've got here in Thurston County. We've got, um, based on DNR forestry data, we've got um, 
less than 7% of the state forest lands in Thurston County are more than 80 years old or considered legacy forests, and that's about 4,500 acres. Um, you know, the Center for Responsible Forestry estimates that 1,400 of those acres are protected by riparian management zones or other types of conservation areas. So that makes what is considered to be about 3,100 acres of unprotected legacy forest or about 4.5% of the lands actively managed by DNR in Thurston County that we're talking about when we're talking about these legacy forest pieces. So, so then going back to this Oracle cut, um, I started to educate myself. I looked at the statutes related to reconveyance. I, I set up uh, meetings with our prosecuting attorney, our land use attorneys to give us advice about could this work? We didn't think, you know, superficially, my lawyer, my land use lawyers didn't have a great familiarity with it either. They knew about it. The statute says 7922-300 says that when state forest lands acquired from the county are needed by the county for public park use in accordance with the county and state outdoor recreation plans. We didn't think that necessarily applied in Thurston County because we weren't sure. Thurston County is on a set, totally separate point woefully underfunded in our parks. I mean, we always make the we always make the joke that not joke, but we always make the point that the city of Lacey has like 40 park employees, Thurston County has like four and a half. So the idea that we were going to take over, you know, we don't we didn't have a forestry program going like like Heidi described in Jefferson. The idea that we were going to take this and make it a park in any in any form or sense just wasn't didn't seem realistic. We were fighting to maintain our already existing and developed parks. So we weren't sure that was going to work and the oracle cut came and went about a year ago in the tail end of 2021 and so in 2022 a new sale came up in the spring just a few months later the crush sale um a whole bunch of community groups at this point reached out to me um bringing in considerations of climate and carbon sequestration and other things um it was another swath of legacy forest due to be cut and um so they asked me to send a letter um, asking to kind of slow down or, or pose this cut. You know, I didn't have a lot of time and I was still, I still didn't know as much about it as I, as I have learned now. But um, I looked at the data and what I could gather in a few days and um, put it together a letter saying that this was a, you know, we're, we're still interested in our legacy forest pieces and not targeting those uh, in our, in, in the cuts. So that letter, I don't know who got a hold of it, but I, I have to just tell you, I've nothing I've done as a commissioner in four and a half years has created the outpouring of support I got from the community by me sending that letter. So I knew there was a ton of community interest, like relative to any other issue I was working on. So I knew I really needed to dig in and, and learn what Thurston County could do to try to meet to meet the community's concerns on on on, on this. Um, so. That kick started my learning process about the trust and the forestry management um, through WASAC and Timber County Caucus and conferences. I've gone to everything I could I could go to and read as many documents as I could. And around June of this of this year, our Board of County Commissioners got involved. And so if you can go to the next, or actually I can go to the next slide. Great. Uh, okay. So this was, I was contacted by the Center for Responsible Forestry and whether this map is ac exactly accurate or not, it's the best shorthand that I have to kind of show you what the community concerns were and what's going on. So let me explain this map for a minute and then I can talk about what the com commissioners did. So the, the county transfer lands that Heidi was talking about that, that are eligible for potential reconveyance are the yellow and the blue are, would not be outside, would be outside of that. So in my estimation, and then the black, um, the red are legacy forests, but the black are planned timber sales, and they, they largely, as you can see, overlap the red. So if we were trying to save all of these 3,100 acres of, of unprotected legacy forests, we'd be trying to save all the red scraps. And as you can, I say scraps, because that pre presents a challenge for us, is that, you know, it's not a contiguous block of forests that we could, you know, try to develop a program and reconvey and, and, and protect. It's really scattered because of the way cutting's been done over the years. So it creates a challenge for us to know how to go about uh, doing this. Um, and we've got four sales scheduled for the next six months that involve pieces of legacy forest. So the community is really like, you know, there's a high level of urgency among the groups that are, that are working on this in Thurston County because there seems to be a very aggressive schedule of cutting the swaths of our Cal State forest that would be considered legacy forest. So 
I was presenting all this to the county commissioners, so they were on, so they would know what's going on and if they wanted to support me or not, you know, support this. I'm sorry, my I just have to get my light back on. <laughs> All right, so uh, so we were working on this, and uh, right about the same time, we learned about the carbon project, and that and that phase one identified 374 acres of Thurston County Legacy Forest, and there was another 7,500 acres to be identified, and we thought, well, gee, if we could, you know, some communities may want this more than others, and if we could get our legacy forest acres included to a large extent in the phase two of the carbon project, it might be a win-win. We we you know, DNR wouldn't have to change anything and, and we could, we could, you know, meet the community's desire to have these pieces preserved. Um, so the board sent a letter, unanimous letter signed by the board of county commissioners asking two things. One is please include as many pieces of our legacy for us. And here's the mapping that we have of it in your additional 7,500 acres for phase two. Number two, please use all tools at your disposal to modify any planned sales you have, especially these aggressive ones that are coming up in the next you know, year or so, um, to try to, uh, so we don't lose these legacy forest pieces, consult with us, let's come up with some alternative. We're not sure what that would look like. Um, prior to sending that, I reached out to some leaders at some of the junior beneficiaries, like the leader of the library district, the leader, one of the port commissioners to make sure that they understood why we were making these requests and, and what it would mean and, and if they were okay with that and they understood where we were going and, and were comfortable with that. Um, you know, we thought that we could probably mitigate any financial loss if we preserve these four and a half percent of the state forest lands of our county. But even if we didn't, you know, all of us agreed we could manage with four and a half percent less timber revenue based on our budgetary concerns. Simultaneous to that, the, the Thurston Regional Climate Action Steering Committee got involved. I serve as vice chair on that. So they, we have carbon sequestration goals uh, that are aggressive, um, climate, greenhouse gas reduction goals, which can't be met without a additional carbon sequestration. And you know, if we're fighting, we didn't want to be fighting at cross purposes with the way DNR was going about managing capital state forests. So that committee sent a letter to DNR um, and asking them to sort of in line with what the Board of County Commissioners was requesting. Uh, Ty, I, I'd like to uh, just another minute or two would be great if you could. Um... Okay, I will. And I'm almost done then. Um, so the current situation of all that is that um, in phase two, uh, Thurston County was al almost nothing was included. And we were very disappointed by that because we thought that could have been a good result. Um, meanwhile, we've got the four cuts scheduled in the next six months. We we learned through this process that reconveyance is actually a much more flexible tool than we thought and that DNR has been very cooperative in the county's use of that, but we still don't think it fits us for a few reasons. We don't have a forestry program or the means to manage. We have the disjointed nature of our legacy forest pieces, as you can see on the map. Um, less than 30% of those would even be eligible. So we'd like to find a solution that um, allows more community input into the management of our, of our state forest lands in our county. We don't know what that looks like in other counties, but we'd like to see a recognition that these pieces have a, a unique character and are worth preserving, especially the low numbers that they have in Thurston County. We are wide open to any approach to accomplish that. Land transfers, carbon project, changing the legislation, community advisory panels, you know, tribal partnerships, whatever we can do to get to the finish line, we're happy to talk with DNR, community groups, tribe to get there. Um, and if we have to just simply forego that slice of revenue, we can we can manage that. We do not want these trees cut in Thurston County. The community has spoken loud and clear. Wow, Ty, uh, thank you so much. Um, great, um, great presentation in such a short amount of time that we gave you. Uh, Capital Forest continues to be, you know, one of the jewels of Washington State in terms of state forest land. Um, I'm going to take a commercial break. I want to remind everybody that tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we will be having the uh, presentation by uh, several folks who worked on the extended rotation of state forest land and so I, um, the state or forest in general, looking at the benefits associated with that. And I, I add that here now because I think I would imagine that all folks on this call would um, support a uh, healthy timber industry in the state of Washington. I think a lot of the controversy is uh, around how the lands are actually managed, whether there's more retention and older forests. 
but I don't think um, in general, uh, what I'm hearing is um, a, a call to stop producing timber in the state of Washington. It's more along the lines of how the lands are being managed in terms of that forced uh, practice, forced, for silvicultural practices. Going now to Todd Donovan, are you with us from Whatcom? Here we go. Hello. And Lake Whatcom, I, I spent uh, many years uh, there way in my career and was around when that first slide uh, happened. And uh, a lot of those homes were swept away because of unstable slope logging. And we're a long way from that now. So looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for having me. I'm learning a lot here. I don't, excuse me, I don't claim to be an expert in forestry, but I, I just want to say a few things about um, what we're hearing as a council in terms of public expectations about management, um, community concerns about forestry issues, and, and what potentially is the county's role. And, and I'm glad you mentioned Lake Walker because what we've been hearing about um, reconveyance from Heidi and I, and we have... Um, 8,000, over 8,000, nearly 9,000 acres of land around Lake Whatcom that was reconveyed back to the county. Um, a tremendous effort from people starting back in 2006, um, coming up with a plan. The lands commissioner signed off on that in 2007. It took years of surveying and um, you know figuring out <clears throat> um, which taxing districts were, were going to be made whole, et cetera. Um, but by 2013, um, the governor signed this we now have, and it's as people mentioned, the reconveyance lands have to be um, considered as parklands. Um, so we've got 8,800 acres of, of uh, wonderful um, parks, and some of it is contiguous bordering DNR lands mixed in with the watershed. But the primary issue for this was drinking water. The Lake Walkham is a threatened drinking water source. So the public support for this and public interest in this is, was much grounded in, in, in drinking water. Um, the lake is subject to rules that we have to get its its functions back to where they were at some levels pre-development. <clears throat> so this is all part of you. Know, so one of our goals here is is water quality. Um, and back, you know, back when this was going on, there was some discussion about, well, this will be forestry. This will be managed to to make it mature functioning forests. Fast forward to 2022, and that's the, the public expectations, I think, are a bit different, or people have forgot that initial discussion. So we're we're now as a county kind of playing catch up to get, I think, to, to even where Jefferson is with smaller amounts of acreage. Uh, but I started with the, the, the Lake Walkham thing, because you know, that's a whole bunch of land that we're we're still, you know, trying to work on management. Um, the, the, the introduction, the, the Lake Walkham landscape plan was managed. And, you know, this is this is um, how GNR interacts somewhat with with the local government here in terms of of timber sales that's 20 years old and I, I think you know when when we are hearing people's concerns today about timber sales and forestry in the watershed um our ability to respond to that and incorporate the, those concerns or maybe out of sync with that landscape plan so that that's something we're hearing discussion about potentially changing and i'll fast forward to 2022 as an example of this um there was a 40 50 acre sale proposed this year last year um, the Bessie sale that was in, it was in the Lake Walkham watershed, you know, not, not a huge sale, but it, you know, it went through the process of that landscape plan, um, the inter-jurisdictional inter committee of city and, and county um, staff people that went through. Um, and there was a lot, you know, we, we had a lot of controversy, uh, uh, um, all sorts of timber sales, but this one in particular is in the watershed. So um, council writes a letter to DNR. Um, there was there was a lot of pr pressure to just say, please stop this. Um, but you know, could it be considered for legacy, legacy forest? Could it be considered in the carbon project? Um, that what the pause button was hit on that. So that so that creates these public expectations going forward now that um, council can write letters to DNR to stop any timber sale um, that doesn't fit. Um, public expectations about how DNR land should be managed, and and I, you know I, I'll, I'll fast forward a bit to um, the same year, um, the Box of Rain sale, which I think is named after a Grateful Dead song. Some foresters have told me this, um, but up you know not in the drinking water watershed, but in in um, the Nooksack watershed, um, we are getting a lot of public pressure to write to do the same play the same role and take those public concerns to DNR to block that sale um, or to get it into phase two of the carbon plan um, 
or if, uh, before that to get it designated with with legacy tree uh, concerns. Um, so, so that's all going on in terms of what we're hearing about from the public. At the same time, the county is actively acquiring more forest lands in addition to those 8,800 acres in the watershed. Um, we've recently completed purchases um, in the South Fork Valley, Stewart Mountain, 500 acres of, of a, a planned project that might come out to 5,000 acres of commercial forestry that abuts DNR land with the goal of a, another management goal that um, is important locally here, which is stream flow, um, protecting um, salmon habitat, uh, meeting treaty obligations in, in terms of stream flows. Um, and we have legal obligations and treaty obligations to be able to do that. And with all these things, the questions come down to like, you know, how should those reconveyance lands uh, in the watershed, the drinking watershed, how should they be managed? How can we incorporate local folks into doing that, recognizing functions just beyond, you know, beyond just revenue? Um, we're in, you know, and and we're investing. There's a lot of local money, conservation future funds that are going into some of these purchases, um, tax credits that are going to some of these. Um, but you know, you add five thousand on top of that, eighty eight hundred acres. We're we're talking about a lot of land. Um, just last night, actually, no, it was this morning because we were meeting till two o'clock this morning. Um, we great we we um, gave a tax status um, on a, a purchase that our conservation future funds had aided the Walken Land Trust in acquiring over a thousand acres of commercial forestry, um, the Skookum Creek Nooksack drainage, again, you know, with goals of salmon habitat, um, water quality, and, you know, the, the public concerns are locally, like these are our tax dollars, these are our goals, um, how do they mesh with DNR and what's the role of the county and be able to have more of a say about how these, how these lands are going to be are going to be managed, uh, but you know, if you start adding up this acreage, we're, you know, we're getting to fifteen thousand plus, if, if more than that, where we have acres um, either reconveyed back to us from DNR or purchased that are adjacent to DNR um, that we have, ser you know, sincere public pressures about changing the role or having some kind of co-management role. And I, I think we heard about this from Thurston County um, about. You know, what what can we do as a county to respond to concerns and to implement you know our goals in terms of our climate action plan uh, our goals in terms of our, our our comprehensive plans our goals in terms of you know drinking water quality our goals in terms of as I mentioned treaty rights and salmon habitat um and you know and our long-term planning goals re related to all those things are, you know the public expectations today are different than what they were 20 years ago whether we're talking about the Lake Wacom watershed um, or we're talking about stream flow and these other issues um that, that, that's you know I, I'll just I, I didn't I didn't have slides I, I think I said earlier you know I, I was not going to use use too much time here but to kind of you know give you a sense of like so we are we are we have all of these acreage um and we don't have the kind of forest management plan um, that Jefferson County has. We, we, we are just kind of now in the, in the stages of discussing, will we hire a county, you know, forester or contract with somebody to help us do these things and, you know, put that, put, put that person in, um, in a new office of um, um, director of climate uh, impact effects. Um, you know, th we're, we're just starting these discussions now, but part of that is, has to be that, you know, how much co-management can the county have um, it, with with our own lands with DNR, but also with all of these lands, are, you know, they're adjacent to DNR lands. Those lands, the way the DNR lands are going to be managed affects the ability for our plans uh, with the lands we're acquiring or reconve being reconveyed to us in terms of how they're going to meet meet our local goals. Um, and, it's, and it's not just Whatcom County. The city of Bellingham is also, you know, they've bought a lot of acreage of land in the watershed as well. Um, so that I'll, 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 I'll just, I'll kind of leave it at that and, and, and put that out there. But, um, I guess that, you know, my, my main, uh, uh, points are the public expects things that are probably inconsistent with, with a lot of the, um, the present management practices as, as much as they have been advancing, at least here in Whatcom County. Um, we have, you know, what there is the fiduciary responsibility that DNR might have with the lands they're managing, we're spending a lot of local money here that are creating public expectations um, about 
how our lands are going to manage and how that's going to overlap with how DNR is managing their lands. Um, so, you know, how do we do that? I hope we can hear more about that. With this, what does this require state law changing? Um, that, you know, that may be where we need to go. Um, and, and it's not just those lands I've mentioned, but you know, the, of the DNR, a lot of the lands that DNR manages here that are that are straight DNR lands, um, the, the taxing districts that benefit from those, we you know, Whatcom County is, 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 is a large one, as, long, as, as well as all these other taxing districts. Like, how do we incorporate them more into decisions about long-term goals um, for managing these forest lands? Um, so that's where we are as a county. In some ways, we're, we're way ahead in terms of, of acquiring the forest land. We're maybe behind um, in some ways in, in terms of planning for how they're going to be managed. So that's what I got. Thanks. Oh, uh, okay, I'm back. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I ended quick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, gosh, um, that that was just great. Um, let's see. Um, I want to just make a couple uh, comments here before we move on to Dr. Toth. Uh, first of all, thank you for all for the county commissioners. Thank you for being elected and uh, going forth and um, serving the serving your public. And I think um, it's a tough, tough job, but I really do appreciate that um, the three of you brought forward, I think, to the discussion is the interest that uh, citizens of Washington have in how their uh, state forests are managed. And, and I guess um, um, we have a, I have an, an active team here help supporting me. I understand there's been a lot of discussion in the chat and I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, reasonable minds may disagree on the interpretation of CNWV uh, Franz, uh, but I think everyone agrees in the broader uh, notion that um, the court did say that uh, DNR does not have to maximize uh, revenue generation. So how that's interpreted can be up for debate, but how that is what the court said, and that the court did say that there was broad, broader discretion uh, that the department could use. Again, caveating that with undivided loyalty and all those other uh, trust principles. I do have a, though, I wanna address a direct question to me from my friend, Matt. Um, Miguel, didn't the Thurston County Commissioner, I guess that's you, Ty, just state he did not want these trees cut in Thurston County. It seems inconsistent with the diverse bitter pool of success for timber industry. I think you're right, Matt, and I've kind of missed that. So I apologize, Ty, if I mischaracterized what I thought you said. I do um, know, though, from working with people who are involved in the legacy forest, some of your constituents, Ty, that uh, they're broader concern is about clear cutting basically and uh, different types of civil cultural management would probably open the door to their consideration of having some management of these lands so um i think we'll move on now to our um, next presenter who again we're very grateful to have uh, dr sandor toth an expert in the field that he is going to be presenting to us and also thankfully for all of us, he chairs the technical advisory committee that uh, the department has put together. I think it was actually a request of the timber industry to create this uh, group who are going to be advising DNR on how to um, put together a sustainable harvest calculation. So, uh, Dr. Toth, we look forward to hearing from you and um, please take it away. Well, thank you very much. We, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the group. Um, for inviting me to this to this discussion, I I did not um, uh, prepare slides. I have a couple of visuals that I might share with you um, um, as this conversation proceeds further. Uh, so I, I decided that uh, within the twenty minutes that I have here, I would like to talk a little bit about. Um, what I do, what I, why uh, I'm being called an expert in multi-objective um, optimization of natural resources decision making, and perhaps give you a few examples of the work that I had done in the region, the Pacific Northwest region, um, uh, that pertains to 
to, to this expertise. And I would also like to share with you um, some details about my work as a, a technical advisor to uh, the DNR. And I, ha I have a long uh, uh, collaboration with the DNR, so I will, I will share with you some of the projects that might give you an idea as to how I can help um, these groups um, moving into the future as they collaborate with, with the Department of Natural Resources. So, um, so what does multi-objective optimization mean? Um, so I work with um, models. I build models that can, can aid uh, forest management um, or natural resource decision-making in situations where there's conflict between the management objectives that the different stakeholders, uh, user groups, et cetera, uh, articulate uh, towards the decision maker, the decision makers. So I try to build the models together with the stakeholders and the decision makers in such a way so that they would they would understand exactly how the model works uh, so that there would be uh, trust in terms of the value of the of the results that these models provide. And, and, and so whenever I collaborate with, um, whether it's a national forest or a private landowner, uh, the city of Seattle, et cetera, um, we have the first step as an ex, the first step that I, I, I attempt to do uh, in the process of, of capturing the, the objectives and the constraints and the concerns of uh, the stakeholders in these decision models is, is to understand exactly where they are coming from. And I don't want to underplay the importance of, 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 of understanding the objectives and the concerns of the decision makers because, um, because what goes into these mathematical models really has a big impact on the value uh, and the trust you can put into what, what the model produces. And, and so I also want to emphasize to the group that I do not decide what the stakeholders' objectives, constraints, and concerns should be like. My job is, is just uh, the modeler. How can those concerns and objectives be best captured in a model um, that would help us quantify the trade-offs that are behind those objectives, those management objectives. And, and so I would like to also um, emphasize to the group that sometimes it's not clear in advance whether or not two different interests that are being communicated to the decision maker, to the land manager from stakeholders. It's not always clear that those objectives are going to be in conflict until we do the analysis. And so that, that statement might, uh, might be surprising to some of you, but, um, but it, it does happen. And, and, and so another value that these modeling exercises can bring to the table is just to show you how much synergy or how much uh, conflict there might be between or behind these management objectives. <clears throat> and, and so I believe that the better understanding and the quantification of these trade-offs uh, is helpful to, to, to the group in order to converge towards a compromise management plan if, 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 if there is no win-win-win-win-win solution to the problem, uh, which is very rare, by the way, where it's very rare in natural resource management to have a win-win, everybody wins. Um, but there is uh, a potential for, for better compromises than for less optimal compromises. And when I say better compromises, I really mean that, say, how can we reduce, um, say, fire hazard on the landscape, on a municipal watershed? Um, how can we reduce fire hazard by a certain amount, but at least cost to, say, 
the total area of um, of a certain habitat type, uh, or old growth forest patches, uh, etc. So I work with moles that can map out these kind of quantitative trade-offs uh, with regards to uh, managing land for multiple objectives. Um, and, and so a couple of examples, a couple of very recent examples, I've worked, uh, we just finished a project with the city of Seattle, a Cedar River watershed is, um, is a municipal watershed of about 95,000 acres that provides a city with, uh, with water. Uh, I've worked with the city and the stakeholders and different user groups to build a model that would identify uh, optimal management plans for those 95,000 acres for the next uh, eight to 20 years. Um, subject to 13, uh, one, three, uh, uh, competing management objectives, which included some hydrological objectives that have to do with the water that would come off those lands, uh, fire hazard, uh, old growth forest habitat preservation, um, uh, helping uh, helping in, in accelerating uh, the development of of, of um, 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 uh, Late several states, late several stage for structures, etc. So um, this is just one example of what I've did uh, close to close to where we are here in the Pacific Northwest. I have projects in Alaska on the Tongass National Forest. Um, I'm actually working with them there um, on the Prince of Wales uh, Island, where we try to figure out how to how to find the best balance between allocating different management actions or no actions or restoration actions to parts of the land in such a way so that um, uh, the different management objectives that are communicated to, to the forest from local communities and beyond are best uh, achieved. And some of these objectives include subsistence hunting, objectives related to create the creation of uh, forage habitat for um, for deer, uh, recreational objectives, um, uh, uh, timber for local mills, uh, etc. Um, and so, once again, in these projects, I do not uh, define what uh, management objectives uh, the stakeholders should have. Uh, my job is to how to translate those, how to best capture those objectives. In, in a rigorous structured modeling framework that would tell us, hey, if we want to put this much emphasis on this objective versus uh, another objective, this is how the management plan going into the next, say, 100 years should look like. And when I say management plan, uh, the management plan that these models produce are spatially explicit and temporally explicit. They, they show which actions or no actions should take place uh, across the land for each, uh, uh, let's say, polygon that represents a forest stand or a management unit. Um, if we were to find, if we were to define the balance between these objectives this way versus that that way, I do not decide how much weight should be placed on the different objectives, but I do show my models do show what the trade-offs are if we switch those weights across the entire weight space. Um, and so that's what I mean by quantifying the trade-offs. Um, with regards to my work with the DNR, um, I, so as Miguel pointed out, I'm the chair of the Technical Advisory Council uh, for the DNR. And, 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 and what we are doing there really is, is, is responding to, to DNR's uh, questions as to how to best uh, address certain management needs and objectives in their forest estate model um, that looks at the 100 year, year planning horizon into the future. And, and as uh, Duane pointed out, the first 10 year of which is going to be subject to uh, board approval and uh, public comments. But even before I, uh, assumed this role uh, in the technical advisory committee, 
I've worked with, the, I've reviewed the DNR sustainable harvest calculations in the past. Um, I, 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 I provided uh, management solutions that would, for example, look at the road system and see how the road system can be streamlined in such a way so that they would have as little environmental effect uh, on, on, on fish habitat as possible, uh, um, et cetera. With regards to reviewing sustainable harvest calculations, um, what I what I've done in the past and then what I'm available to do in the future is to is to go through uh, the internal policies of the organization, whichever organization it might be, um, looking at the uh, uh, um, the statutes. I I look at how those requirements are captured in the mall structure uh, because there is a mall behind the sustainable harvest calculations and and I think it, it's it, it, and Dana, Dana, I think it's important to emphasize that that um, sustainable harvest levels those numbers don't just come you know from uh, uh, so over the envelope uh, calculations these these come from these decision models that I'm talking about. And, and so how can these, these, these rules and policies be captured in that model? I check whether they, they are uh, uh, sufficiently incorporated in, in the model structure itself. And if they are not, then I make recommendations. Yes, this is how, it, how you could improve uh, the, the, the level at which that specific rule is incorporated in the model. Um, and so, and so then I write my my recommendations with regards to that, and I think this is a, these these are available for the public to look at. Um, now, I don't know how much time I have, Miguel, left. Maybe a few minutes. Um, oh, you got uh, another uh, uh, five minutes or so. Five minutes. Okay. So I it, it sounds like it, there is there's this this big question, sort of the the four hundred pound gorilla in the in the room and that is you know what if what if we understand the trade-offs uh and the trade-offs are severe behind uh computing management objectives so what what can be done um in order to resolve that conflict and bring different interests uh to to a compromise that doesn't necessarily make everyone happy but um but it is it gets it, it is as costly as it, it 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 creates as low cost to uh to all of the stakeholders as, as possible and so so really um the answer i have two i have two answers that i can offer to that discussion one is that in my experience uh the biggest benefit of um of going through the model model building exercise that I've just attempted to describe a few minutes ago, that process itself uh, uh, is valuable to the stakeholders. That's what I'm hearing as a feedback because it forces them to 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 very explicitly articulate what they want, how they want them, where and when, and 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 that process itself is is valuable to to others at the table who might have different interests because they they th the process itself can help them better understand each other's concerns not just uh in principle but 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 with regards to what to do on the ground where and when um so the mall building process is is one big benefit and and very often we at the end of the day uh the user groups don't even need to use the results of my mall because through the mall building process, they've already resolved the conflict uh, uh, within the group. The, the other thing that I would like to, to point out here, and I don't know if I can share uh, my screen. It sounds like I can. Um, I, I've developed uh, an online bidding platform uh, called EcoCell. Um, and this is available here. I can copy and paste the link uh, to the chat uh, if somebody wants to take a closer look at this. So this is this is an online bidding platform where uh, forest 
owner um, could say that, uh, you know, I'm willing to manage my forest in a way that's different from, from uh, whatever I would do without input from uh, anyone else. And then, and then anybody can bid um, with dollars uh, using credit cards uh, to, to have an impact on, on what that landowner does. So if the landowner uh, is trying to maximize revenues and, uh, but, but people want to have a say as to how that piece of land is managed, uh, private land is managed beyond what's required by the law, then, uh, uh, then they are able to sort of do a crowd, crowdfunding effort uh, to, to move management away from profit maximization towards, say, uh, uh, habitat optimization or, 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 or any other uh, direction that, that the, uh, the, the stakeholders might, might desire. And, 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 and just want to uh, quickly mention here that uh, uh, one of the benefits of these uh, public uh, uh, contribution games, that's a technical name for these kinds of bidding uh, processes, is that the bids can add up. If you have $5, uh, you can uh, use social media, which is built into the platform, to convince others to also chip in $5. And that can add up if you find, if, if you create a snowball effect uh, in, in this crowd funding campaign to, to support uh, alternative management plans. And so I haven't used this tool in the United States yet, but, uh, but we had some, uh, some uh, mock runs in, uh, in Portugal, uh, Sweden, uh, France, Austria, and Sweden uh, this year in the past. So uh, I just want to mention that this is sort of a market solution to some of the conflict, conflict resolution um, uh, challenges that you, you you face. I'm not saying that this is uh, this is the solution for you. We just just wanted to 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 show you examples of, of the work that I do that might be relevant. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Toth. And uh, actually, I'm going to come back to you with our first question. If I take the uh, uh, privilege of being the moderator here, but I want to, um, well, I want to address a couple things. Uh, first, uh, we've got quite a team here helping me uh, behind the scenes, so I appreciate it. I understand there's been a lot of uh, interest in this conference, excuse me, panel. Maybe this should be a conference in, a, in of itself, uh, but we've, you know, I guess there's a few themes that are coming up. Um, uh, CEPA review, uh, incorporation of carbon, county reconveyance, code management, DNR's carbon offset project, um, lots of uh, interest in all those. We're gonna put together um, some questions that sort of try to capture um, the themes that we're seeing. Um, let me just say, oh, and I see that Ty may have to uh, leave at 120, so we'll keep that in mind as we are asking our questions. Um, so uh, let me uh, scroll here to, okay, great. Um, uh, Dr. Toth, uh, just yesterday, uh, the board adopted a uh, resolution and, um, in the resolution, uh, they've directed the department, um, to, I'm going to read part of it here. Uh, I'll try to uh, abridge it, but to use, uh, available inventory data in a multi-objective optimization to explore the implications of incorporating but not necessarily include additional objectives into this next harvest calculation. Uh, the additional objectives uh, may include, but are not limited to stored carbon, uh, watershed production, fish and wildlife habitat attributes, ecological functions and values uh, associated uh, carbon sequestration, forest health, landscape structural diversity and local community um, economies. Uh, as well, they want um, the department to ex explore and include specific alternative harvest techniques, uh, which may include, but are not limited to various levels of tree retention and alternative thinning regimes, uh, et cetera. So given that new direction, um, what are your thoughts from the technical advisory committee? Uh, is DNR um, capable of uh, taking that on this, this, uh, 
this uh, calculate this calculation is there modeling up to this uh, what changes would you see needed and is is it possible what the what's being asked yeah so uh, so the dnr is currently using uh um an industry standard uh, modeling framework called woodstock and this woodstock model uh is 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 the most model that creates uh the management um plans going into into the future 100 years and 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 the first 10 years of those decisions are revised by the pub uh, i reviewed by the public and the um and and, and the board of natural resources and, and they have to approve that um but then the dnr reruns that mall every 10 years now so this mall uh is i have to say that this is an industry standard. There's a lot that can be done with this mall, but there are, the, the mall also has some, some, um, some issues, and, um, and 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 those issues are technical in that, um, you know, how much uh, spatial specificity uh, can be derived from from the management planning recommendations that come out of this mall. Um, and, and to what extent can the mall address complicated objectives? So, for example, I've in the past worked with uh, conservation organizations where uh, the objective was not just maximizing, for example, the amount of habitat for a certain species in need of protection, but also the, the spatial structure of that habitat, connectivity, contiguity, yeah, interior, uh, area of the habitat uh, as opposed to edge habitat, etc. So, so with, uh, with Woodstock Mall, these kind of nuances are hard, it's hard to capture them. Uh, and and I, I don't want to get into the technical jargon here. It's a linear programming based mall as opposed to uh, one that is uh, that, that, that can take into uh, spatial, take into account spatial and logical considerations, just like the one example I, I shared with regards to spatial habitat conservation. So, so I've um, I've made this recommendation in the past, and I'm, I keep making this recommendation as to you know as 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 to um, either add to to components to the model that would allow us to do this spatial uh, 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 analysis or, or or move away from the Woodstock model. Uh, but again, it's I'm not the decision maker here. I'm I'm a technical uh, advisor, and 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 I don't want to downplay the capacity of the Woodstock Mall to provide uh, management plans. But but I also want to be be uh, honest with regards to its limitations, and so that I've just described that limitation to you. Um, the other limitation, it's very hard to do. The kind of multi-objective analysis that I described during my my twenty minutes. It's hard to do with the Woodstock model without some uh, some serious uh, uh, um, you know technical intervention going into the model and 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 add code or rewrite, rewrite the code. And so typically, when I worked with this kind of platform, I add my own module that would communicate with uh, uh, the, mm -hmm. the clients the client system. Yeah. And try to to help that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know to what extent you want me to get into no, this. No, well, I, well, well. It sounds it sounds to me like you know you've answered the question, and uh, I guess for the sake of time, I, we'll move on. But it does seem like um, the DNR is going to have its hands full in terms of meeting this new resolution, in terms of what the tools they have, and and there may need to be some adjustment to the tools uh, that they currently use to follow uh, the direction of the board. But you know, thank you very much. I'm going to move to um, questions from the folks out there, and we've got one from Alex Harris. Um, she uh, would you. Uh, this is to the county commissioners, uh, in total, in general. So, and council member, um, would you be supportive of a policy change that allows counties to co-manage state forest board lands with DNR? These lands are supposed to be managed. Um, on behalf of the counties, but currently counties don't have any formal influence in how those lands are co-management or managed. Co-management could be an attractive alternative to reconveyance and would allow these lands be managed according to local concerns, needs while remaining 
consistent with DNR's uh, HCP. So any um, anyone want to take that on or all of you want to take that on? I'll just say absolutely. That's from uh, Commissioner Menser. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll agree. And I mean, how we get there is, is, is maybe the bigger question. Um, but co-managing lands that DNR can now manages, but I also say, you know, and having some collaborative relationship with how we manage our own lands that have been reconveyed or that we've been purchasing to, to coordinate uh, a lot of these areas that are contiguous that are DNR or that are county and that border each other. I guess to you, uh, Heidi. Yeah, I would just add that in our letters to DNR earlier in the year about um, the Beaver Valley sorts and Pennywise timber sales, we we posed that question. Collaborative, we called it collaborative management, which is co-management. But we said we would be interesting and in, interested in developing collaborative management strategies with DNR, and they came back very open to that. So um, we're now in the process of working with some of the staff in our region to talk about what some options are for some parcels in East Jefferson County and um, are kind of uh, tiptoeing down that pathway. But there are, as as um, Todd just said, there are a lot of, there are more questions than answers on what collaborative or co-management means. It, you know, is reconveyance actually more efficient or a better strategy for DNR and the counties? These are all overarching questions, but um, we are already in the process of working with our DNR colleagues, and um, I always think that developing relationships with your local land managers is a, should be a really important priority and something that, you know, I prioritize coming into my mm -hmm. role as commissioner and instead of starting out in an adversarial um, stance, uh, starting out, you know, how can we do this better together? And so I'm a little bit sometimes an over optimist, but I think my optimism gets me down the road in a lot of cases, and I feel like it probably will around this question. Uh, thanks for that. And you know, you do have a dedicated group of DNR field foresters out there. I'm sure yeah. you've worked directly with the district manager in Straits. You know, yep. really smart guy and really trying to do the right thing. So, uh, but you know, it has to work within the policies and directions that they're given. But yes, they're they're a great bunch. Uh, so, for the commissioners, what support do you need from the state and stakeholders to help meet your goals for state forest land management in your community? Well, because I'm unmuted, I'll just start out. I saw another question in the Q and A about, um, you know, ch changing the law for reconveyance. Um, currently, the reconveyance rule uh, are in RCW. It says that lands can only be reconveyed for parks, and um, there may be, you know, a, that I think there's an opportunity to open that up a little bit. Um, if, if if conserving our forest lands is really part of the goal here, then why don't we allow our, allow our counties to reconvey the state forest transfer trust lands for forest conservation in our community? Or in some in some cases, there are um, uh, recreational resources that are not necessarily part of our parks department, but maybe a larger regional uh, recreation resources like the Olympic Discovery Trail. Um, and then also in terms of wildlife and connectivity, there may be good reason to protect some parcels or pull them out of management or change the management of them because they are uh, connect connective tissue for wildlife corridors or wildlife mm -hmm. movement. And so I think there are other reasons other than just pure vanilla parks to consider um, bringing mm -hmm. bringing lands back into the count into county ownership and management. Yeah. Council I, member Don Donovan, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, because that as soon as you call it a park, it creates public expectations mm -hmm. that are going to be very different than managing a forest. And w if there is a way to you know brand some of those reconveyances as as different, um, but the public expectations that come with calling something a park make make discussions about forest management in that park challenging mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I totally agree with you and uh well that's another just topic for discussion but you know a conservation park or a forest conservation park or something along those lines might might help you get along there uh Dwayne you're not off the hook I'm gonna direct a question to you um 
Yep, your mic is hot. We see you. You're still here. Thank you very much. I know you're busy and for participating with us. But at the end of your presentation, you mentioned new policies, new ways of managing state lands at the end of your presentation. What might these look like? How could they respond to the local interests we've heard about from the local leaders who presented today? Your thoughts? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, uh, really, as the um, we're embarking on that next sustainable harvest, uh, we'll be looking at uh, you know things that we've heard and uh, things to respond to some of the things we've heard from county commissioners from uh, uh, WEC Conservation Northwest and others. Um, you know, we're currently looking at things like climate resilience, how you uh, incorporate uh, climate resilience into um, into the model and the modeling. Like I said, we're looking out 100 years. Um, we're then looking at what to do in the next 10. Um, but how do you how do you then, you know, have that long term look on something like climate resilience, as I think, you you know, you said the climate is going to be different in 100 years. I think we all know that. And so how do we, as a prudent trust manager, ensure that we don't see catastrophic loss? That's one of the things in the policies for sustainable forests, right? How do we address forest health, address west side, potential west side forest health issues. Um, but then there are the others, uh, you know, in the those societal and those changing societal expectations, um, you know, uh, so how do we try and incorporate things like that? Um, you know, I, I think I meet with Commissioner Eisenhower more than I do with uh, our own commissioner. Um, Heidi and I are <laughs> collaborating on so many different things uh, from great. trust land transfer to encumbered lands uh, to um, uh, carbon to, uh, you know, looking at, you know, can we collaborate more uh, on uh, the county trust lands in Jefferson County? Um, and as you all see, it's it's a complex issue and you have a number of stakeholders. Um, people like reconveyance, but uh, there are tribes who do not like reconveyance. Mm -hmm. That's right. We we have lands that we have wanted to uh, 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 actually uh, transfer to the city of Bellingham, and the tribes are very opposed to it. Not because it's not a great idea. The land they think no, that's great, but the large reconveyance in yep. Whatcom County, they are opposed to that yep. because it affects their tribal treaty rights. And, and again, so it's, all of these issues are complex. Yeah. Um, and so it takes a lot of talking, a lot of meeting, uh, a, a lot of collaborating to to get, you know, to those solutions. And I was, uh, yes, and you might have tribes that may differ on that one tribe. Right. Exactly. Yes, so. You will, <laughs> you will have three tribes that all have, yeah. you know, rights or interests in that area, all disagreeing the yeah. same with junior taxing districts that all yeah. have differing opinions uh, as commissioner yeah. eisenhower uh, i think yeah. knows uh, uh commissioner uh, ty i i wanted to get back to you um if i want to make sure you on the co-management question if you had any thoughts for thurston county how that might look well yeah I, a couple of things are connecting here and I, I want to, so, you know, we're not as interested in reconveyance and I, I tried to answer that in one of the chat, yeah. but, you know, given the Nate, given that only 30% ish of our, of our land is, is that um, type of eligible for reconveyance county trust land or whatever it's called. Um, and we have no resources or history of man. We're not. We're not looking to be in the board in, in the business of managing for it. We'd rather DNR. They're the experts. We'd rather they do it. But we're hoping to have this. When when I say co-management, I'm thinking about input into the evolving community concerns that we're seeing mm -hmm. in the light of look. You know, when, when local jurisdictions are out fighting climate change and creating plans and investing money and resources, I can't tell you how many dozens and dozens of hours and, and mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of dollars tens and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars that our county's put into this, we don't want to be working at cross purposes with, mm. you know, a whole other set of, of interests and management strategies, because forests are a key part of all of that. So, yeah. you know, I want to, I only have a few minutes and I have to excuse myself, but a, sure. couple, people, a couple people in your, in your question, Q&A asked, what is a legacy forest? And since I use that term a few times, I, and where is it in the policy? I want to address that because it connects to this, this question. Um, Legacy forest is a, is a term that's being used to to describe forest pieces that are um, like 80 plus years old before like modern clear cutting techniques were in, in, in play. And so there the argument is they're 
they're a little bit more diverse and constructionally complex and, and have a chance to sort of regenerate into a more old growth like state in, in, in a shorter period of time. So we should be prioritizing this. Now, what I learned in the, in the phase two conversation for DNR at another presentation I was at was how many different things that they were juggling. And we knew they were juggling like a lot of priorities. We said, we, we know you're juggling these things, but we just want you to know that our legacy forest preservation is our top community priority. But then I learned, you know, they were trying to manage, you know, the different swaths that connect to like spacing things out in time and over mm -hmm. space to not to, to minimize economic impacts. I mean, there are a lot of things they were doing and I understand that. And that was a juggle. There may not have just been any way to make the puzzle fit, but but one of the people asked, where in, in, in the policies or in the law is legacy forest? And that's, it really isn't. It's a thing that people, that, that scientists and community folks are, are looking at and saying, we think this should be recognized as something, you know, so that's kind of where, from my perspective, the, the conversation or the debate, you know, is from Thurston County. If we can get a recognition that these swaths of legacy forest have some value, carbon sequestration and other things, um, a whole list of things, then we think we can have a better conversation about prioritization of the cuts. I mean, we're not saying don't cut. We're not somebody asking, yes. aren't you saying that we can't, you know, isn't that going to kill it? We're talking about trying to preserve 4.5% of, of, of our lands in Thurston County um, through a priority, but DNR is juggling so many different things that it's been making that challenging. And I, and I, and I get that, but I, we'd, we'd love to be engaged. And it sounds like we need to follow Heidi's path and and get Dwayne on speed dial and have those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for that clarification. And I appreciate your involvement. We're going to shift topics. So here, uh, move over to uh, a question from Steve Erickson. Um, beside the uh, besides the conservation Northwest v. Franz decision, a Jefferson County judge recently ordered DNR to conduct SEPA analysis on two timber sales and include climate impacts in that environmental review. In light of these rulings, how will DNR approach management? Oh my gosh, okay, SEPA review. Um, I'm sure uh, Dwayne will wanna talk about that and so will Heidi and maybe everybody else, but go ahead. Uh, who would like to take that on first? Yes, SEPA is my favorite topic. Um, so SEPA is, for those that aren't aware, the State Environmental Policy Act. Um, so the, the long and short, Backstory on this, uh, there were two sales in Jefferson County uh, that were challenged uh, by uh, two groups, or I think it, there were a number of groups that uh, joined in on the, the challenge to SEPA, um, which is a, a record review of how the department did the analysis of uh, the, uh, the environmental impacts on those two timber sales. Um, when we do our large planning efforts, so our recent decision for the Marble Murelet uh, Conservation Strategy and our uh, uh, EIS for the Sustainable Harvest uh, Calculation, which is for this planning decade, 2015 um, uh, to 2024, um, both of those incorporate um, an analysis and did incorporate an analysis of uh, the impacts of those major decisions on climate, on carbon sequestration. Um, individual timber sales, uh, the department does do a SEPA checklist for individual timber sales. Um, so we, at that project level, we look and say, what are the impacts to that timber sale? Um, in those uh, SEPA checklists, we don't then again, we haven't been going and redoing that carbon look on that individual timber sale at the project level. Um, what we also failed to do was incorporate by reference that broader work that we had already done for those two major planning efforts. Um, so uh, the judge, because the judge ruled from the bench, um, we have the transcript of that, but um, we don't have the actual order yet. Um, but in general, uh, and I'll wait for Peter to give his reply in the, um, in the chat and I'll wait for Martha to rebut that, um, but my perspective as a non-lawyer is that the judge said, great, lots of analysis, great work, too bad you didn't incorporate that into your SEPA checklist. Um, so going forward, we will be incorporating that uh, work into the SEPA checklist. Uh, it doesn't mean that every timber sale, uh, from my perspective, needs a full carbon calculation of the wood removed, the emissions from harvesting activities, uh, the carbon sequestered in the wood products. Um, but 
that's what that work was in that larger EIS, those two larger EISs. So we will be incorporating that information uh, as we go forward. Hopefully that wasn't incredibly boring for people who aren't involved in SEPA day to day. Oh, gosh, uh, we love SEPA, <laughs> don't we? So speaking of Peter Goldman, I, I can't believe it. He, he, he Peter, you have a question. You're so shy, but here we go. Uh, beyond talking about the forest climate's resilience, we should be talking about how we can manage forests to better sequester carbon or minimizing the release of greenhouse gases from logging. How can DNR manage our forests? This must be for you, Duane, for climate change, given that some counties, Lewis, Skagit, believe DNR does not have the authority to do so, as demonstrated by objections to DNR's recent carbon offset project. In short, what could be the what could the path forward look like for managing state lands for carbon sequestration and storage? So again, a good question. Um, and Peter is right. Uh, the SEPA for our um, carbon project has been challenged in Superior Court. Um, I won't talk much more about that because that is ongoing litigation. Um, but uh, the department has been looking at a number of alternatives to, you know, really address carbon, address climate. Um, and it goes to uh, the Conservation Northwest decision. Uh, we recognize that we can manage our lands for a number of purposes. Uh, we have a uh, hopefully uh, growing uh, clean energy program. Uh, I know that, I, spoiler alert, I think the commissioner will uh, note that in her uh, address later today. Um, we are exploring deep carbon capture uh, technology and leasing for that on state lands, looking at geothermal uh, production. Um, the carbon project is another attempt to utilize uh, trust lands for alternative uh, ways to generate revenue, to diversify the portfolio. Um, we also uh, know uh, that forests, actively managed forests, sequester carbon. Our analysis, like I said, in those EISs show that all of the alternatives that were considered by the board um, for the Muralette and the, uh, 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 the sustainable harvest calculation show that we're sequestering much more carbon that's being admitted, uh, admitted by our management. So are there ways uh, to look at increasing the amount of carbon that's stored while continuing to generate revenue for beneficiaries, while you know, not harming rural communities and forest industry um, that has those then downstream consequences. If, if we see milling infrastructure and logging infrastructure on the west side disappear like it did on the east side, we're gonna see a lot more forest health problems. The reason we have, one of the reasons we have so many forest health problems on the east side is because mm -hmm. there's that lack of infrastructure Mm -hmm. to actually be able to manage those lands. Mm -hmm. And so then you're seeing more catastrophic fires, et cetera. So again, not an easy balance. And that's something that we need to try and strike is that balance. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we're going to be looking at in this next sustainable harvest calculation. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, we are closing in on our uh, time here. Um, geez. Uh, and I'm looking at my questions. Um, I'm going to get to this one in a second. Um, I just wanted to, uh, again, personal point of personal privilege here. Um, and I think uh, most all the folks that are engaged uh, in this topic that are on chat right now and in the questions would probably all love to see a, a more robust interaction with the Board of Natural Resources as they take on this next sustainable harvest calculation. So uh, I would suggest that, um, Dwayne, that you all consider maybe having some, uh, maybe a special board meeting where you have panels with industry and commissioners, county commissioners, and environmentalists and pro purchasers, kind of, you know, lay out um, uh, in a very orderly way. You guys would vet it and organize it, but have, have a more public and robust discussion around uh, this next sustainable harvest calculation. I think the board would benefit from it. And it would be a much more satisfying interaction with the board than we presently have when we get, you know, 120 seconds. So that's my commercial. <laughs> I'll put it out there. So um, 
I've got a question here uh, from Steve and Driga. I hope, sorry, I hope I pronounced that correct. Um, uh, as a second generation practicing forester for nearly 40 years, I've watched the ever increasing complexities of active forest land management resulting in a dichotomy of issues. The need to increase pace and scale to address forest health versus the loss of infrastructure of both operators and processing facilities and the need for more prescribed burning versus clean air requirements, more carbon on the landscape versus the sustainability due to climate change and or insect fire disease issues, et cetera. How do we continue to be active stewards of this land? And I, I, I think I may um, pivot that question to Dr. Toth. You, uh, you might be able to better uh, describe uh, the uh, discussions. If you could summarize sort of the controversies or not controversies, but perspectives that you see being brought forward in the uh, advisory committee, uh, how people may look at this question differently, what you've seen as chairing that, that committee. Yeah, so with regards to the question about polarization of issues, and um, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't tell you whether it is more polarized now than it it, it used to be because um, I'm not measuring uh, polarization. Uh, but I, but I, 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 based on my experience when I when I work with um, uh, uh, stakeholder groups that have uh, different interests, we, we often find that, uh, that when you when you get down to the details and you talk about uh, the explicit details of what to do or what not to do on the landscape and when, we often find that maybe there isn't as much conflict between those interests as 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 we might initially perceive, just based on. Of the rhetorics and 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 posturing, et, et cetera. So uh, you know, this is not to say that, that 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 the environment is is less polarized now than it used to be. I'm I'm, I'm I what I am trying to articulate is to is to actually get down, get sit down to the table, work with the decision makers, work with the other groups, face each other, and and and, and use people like me to to try to translate those concerns into into a structured rigorous framework that could uh, that I would like to believe that would be helpful to you in order to manage those uh, those conflicts. Uh, well, thank you so much. And I think we will end uh, on that note. I want to remind folks um, that the next session starts in 30 minutes, two o'clock, and the topic will be uh, four climate tests for durable wood products. I will um, end the conference by our panel excuse me um and thanking all of you for participating and I, on a positive note i think we are evolving and have been evolving uh, as forest land managers uh, and people who enjoy the wood products and recreation and the wildlife that washington's forests uh, provide all of us and uh, as a measure of involvement of evolve, evolving i'll uh, quote when um the notion was uh, put forward the legislature as whether or not to take your county forest lands and reforest them. The governor then, Martin, said, you know, someone who would plant a tree, what, are they crazy? I mean, that, not, that's that's ridiculous. So we've come a long way from from that comment and where we are today. So and that was, um, uh, I guess, a testament to uh, the involvement of the public and how we all treasure these lands. Again, uh, board meetings, uh, you can go to the DNR website um, and there is uh, always an agenda being posted and the and all of the uh, uh, work items are there. You can review, comment, and um, so stay engaged and uh, we'll see you uh, at two o'clock. Thanks everyone again for a very uh, robust and uh, uh, provocative panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.